Well, hi, and thanks for joining me here in my shop uh, this morning. So I'm going to start the process of uh, replacing some of the capacitors in this uh, radio. I'm going to try to do it in some uh, some way that uh, teaches me something. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. So, uh, but before I get going, uh, I just walked in my shop here, just ready to get started, and I looked in this radio, and I got kind of uh, concerned. So it's the dust. It's the dust in this radio. Um, I think you can see it on the camera. Uh, you can certainly see my fingerprints through here. You see the dust is kind of a blackish, blackish color in there, a dark color. And it's, of course, on every uh, upper surface. The, this radio sits like this in the cabinet, so dust coming down this way will settle on all these upper surfaces. So you can see this is covered with this dark uh, dust. Now normally dust doesn't concern me much. You know, what is dust? mostly human skin cells I understand but under this radio the situation is a little bit different because there was a big sheet of asbestos right here all this time now inside the radio when it's operating there's going to be some circulation of air because of components that are hot there's going to be some air movement and we're talking decades and decades uh, uh, of, of this radio sitting how much of that is asbestos and the part that's really got me concerned about this is even as I sit here talking to you I can see crystalline reflections from this dust so asbestos is, is a is, is a stone basically it's a crystal and in the uh, danger is related to the fiber length I, I don't know how long it has to be I think very very tiny fiber a very very tiny piece of a crystalline fiber. Fiber is probably not the right word for it. Um, maybe that's what all this is. This is all asbestos dust. Of the smallest particle size. And I'm going to work away on this radio, taking these parts out, knocking this almost invisible dust into the air here, and I'm going to stick my nose here and breathe some of that stuff in. What I don't know is, is this in any way a significant health hazard? Uh, for someone like me, you know, first I'm a little I'm a little later in life. Um, I shouldn't be afraid to swallow a poison that takes 60 years to work. Um, I shouldn't concern me too much. 60, that's a big number. Eh? <laughs> I'm pretty hopeful. Um, so just on the point of discussion, um, and that, that switches me to my last video I posted on this radio. I took a few minutes and I read carefully the comments that I collected on the video. Uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for those who took the time to write comments. They're clearly very thoughtful and clearly aimed at trying to help me. There's, there's no doubt about that. And what many of the comments were around the question of should I replace all these capacitors? And of course, most people would say yes, and I would say yes also. But it's not up to me. It's up to the person who owns this radio. So what you see me doing is presenting a case uh, on video to the owner. Uh, you're watching the case being presented. And then it, what you don't know is the discussions I have with the owner of these radios. I'm having discussions with them the whole time I'm working on it. Some of the things I'm doing is specifically because they asked me to do it or not do it. And I don't reveal this on the video. It's a personal or private matter between me and the people who own these radios. But what I'm trying to do is put the owners, because they're interested in this. Most of the people who present me with a radio, they have some interest in what's going on. They watch. They, most of them watch my videos and that. So I am thinking very much about them and what they're seeing and what is going on in their heads. And through conversations in email, uh, I can obtain uh, sensible directions from them. And I provide guidance, too, back and forth. So it's not just me making this decision. And then um, if you look at it from the point of view of someone who is trying to collect radios. So here they've got this one, and it's in great shape. It appears to be working as it is. So whatever money he put out already, I can tell you it's around a hundred bucks he's put out to buy this radio. Uh, I'm, I'm about to make him put another hundred, hundred and fifty dollars into this radio. Maybe he'd rather use that money to buy another radio. This one's working. So there are sensible ways to get to the point where you say, just leave it the way it is right now. And my own view about this, uh, working radio with original parts, except for one that I've replaced down here. Um, there's value in that, but the value is only really there if the rest of the radio is pristine. 
So it has to look pristine. The cabinet has to be perfect. We, we have to be really at the top of uh, vintage radios. So if you, if you had one that was like that, that looked pristine, and inside it was all original, and it was working, I would argue strongly to leave it as it is. Because another thing about these radios, and uh, well, one of the comments uh, uh, warned me about the problem of making repairs, not changing all the p bad parts, because they're not so bad yet, returning the radio, and then sometime later you get a phone call from the customer saying, well, thanks for fixing my radio, but it broke already. Well, that was probably true back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s when these radios were played every day. But few of these will ever be played every day again. Most of them are played on a demonstration basis or a curiosity basis. So what's going on there is friends have come over, hey, look at my old radio. Hey, is that radio work? Yeah, watch. On it goes. Ten minutes later, off. Six months of silence after that. Or another one is the owner goes, geez, I haven't played that radio for a long time. Let's see if it's still working. On it goes. Twenty minutes later, off it goes. Six more months of sitting around. Well, that kind of playing, uh, a radio like this with its original parts working now, could be working 20 years from now, still with its original parts. So for sure, a pristine radio, um, and I don't think there's many around anymore, but a pristine looking radio could command a lot of money if it's all original. Maybe not today, maybe 10 years from now, maybe 20 years from now. So if you've got one today that's in an all new state and it's working really well and it's pristine, it's a beautiful looking radio, uh, it has to also be a beautiful looking radio. It can't, can't be an ugly, ugly box. It's just not. You might have something whose value will appreciate dramatically down the road as these things become more and more scarce. And what would make it really scarce is it's all original and still working. And that's where the value would be. So, yes, another comment in there was don't sermonize. <laughs> Just because I read comments doesn't mean I'm going to follow them necessarily. So, uh, But in the case of this radio now, the approach I'm going to take is uh, try to replace the capacitors most likely for interfering with its operation first. I've tried this before and it generally doesn't go all that well, frankly. And try, try to monitor the operation of the radio and spot the improvements as the capacitors are replaced and also testing the capacitors uh, as they come out and this is part of trying to face up to the reality uh, about these things it's easy to make an assumption that all these capacitors are shot probably right maybe maybe shot is way too strong a word for it but that is just an assumption and that's why I usually take the time to test each capacitor as I remove it and the variations I've experienced in doing that are great. They have some radios that would look just like this. All the capacitors test really badly. Another radio would look just like this. And all the capacitors test really quite, quite good. Never perfect. Never like new. Not on an old radio like this. What? Well, I'm still pontif pontificating here. <laughs> I'm supposed to stop that. So, next step. Uh, is either I start replacing capacitors or or I do an alignment. I think I should do a quick check of the alignment. Uh, it would be stunning to me if this is way out of whack. I can't imagine that. But a little pick-me-up might be good. We'll get the radio performing in the best that it possibly can with these parts in it. Then we'll go at the part replacement step by step. And uh, really this is quite an opportunity here uh, to explore in detail the situation with a radio like this. I know some of you might be saying, oh man, just change the capacitors because I have more interesting radios to come in here. But I'd, I'd rather take my time and uh, explore the situation with this radio since it presents such an opportunity. And another interesting thing is, are all the tubes original? I was wondering that the other night. Let's take a look here. Let's take a look and see. So I'm just going to pull the speaker plug out so I can turn this around and also uh, a, a comment about seeing the big speaker I guess maybe I bumped the camera at some point or something I got it off target for a while in the last video and I was staring at this big uh, antenna uh, I apologize for that there's just so many things for me to keep my eye on uh, I, I lose track of some stuff when I'm doing these videos so I apologize for that okay 
Yeah, we're going to look at the tubes and the question. The question will be. So this one is a general electric radiotron. That's a general electric radiotron. That's a general electric. This one here. I'll take a guess. General electric radiotron. one right back here. Um, let me just tip this one out a little bit. Okay. General Electric Radiotron. So I think we're talking about the original tubes are in here too. Uh, these two are almost certainly original. The two output tubes. And the rectifier tube, well, that's just, well, let's pull it out and take a look. This time I'll remember to put it back in. Come on out of there. Whack. General Electric Radiotron. Licensed by Thermionics Limited. Patented 22 to 1939. So, I think there's a chance this is all original tubes. I think there's a really good chance of that. Come on. And I tested these tubes. They're all pretty good. I remember right, the output tubes were just a little on the weak side. Right on the line, in fact. So that is one of the primary things I, I, I think is wrong with this radio, is its output volume is low. So, just going back to the dust now, I'm going to take a close look with my close-up camera here. I'm going to take a close look at it. This is this, uh, I have not done this. I took a peek and then thought this is worth talking about on video, which is why I'm doing this. Have a peek. So you can just look in the focal plane there. So it looks like particulate matter, like looks, looks like it doesn't look like re it doesn't look like the kind of dust I expected to see there. I expected to see really fine powdery stuff. That's what it looks like with my eyes. But with this, this this is really sending up the flags here. This is really sending the warning flags up. Well, I have to take a sample of this and look at it under the microscope more closely. I'm going to do that. I want to find out what the story is here. Uh, what's true here is going to be true in many radios. So let's explore this. Okay, so I simply searched in Google for asbestos dust under the microscope, and in images, this is what we see. So um, you can see the very, very fibrous nature here. This is the kind of thing you'd be looking for in this dust. Wow, that's asbestos? See, the magnification here is really, really different. This is very high magnification. This is lower magnification. Those are birds in a tree, aren't they? <laughs> what is that? So here's a good shot of it. So that's the kind of fibers we're looking for. Look at this picture here. Asbestos, dust, and debris. Look at that. Some more. So the thing is, these fibers are so small, you really have trouble seeing them with your eye. And so we're going to look for this kind of stuff. Now, what would ordinary house dust look like? Would it look just like this? And when I can, let's just take a look. House dust. So lots of things, eh? Dust mites, uh, curving, curving pieces, curly curving pieces. Another bug, round things, probably pollen. Let's look at more bugs. A lot of bugs. Ooh, bugs everywhere. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is scary. Quickly get away from house dust. Okay, so we see bugs on the microscope. Okay, so I gave it a little bit of thought, and believe it or not, I think I think this is the way I want to do this. Uh, I'm going to take this uh, clean, I've already looked at it under the scope, clean black thing I've cleaned off. I'm just going to sweep it on the surface here. This is probably the best surface. And then we're going to look at this under the microscope, and I think that's probably going to be the best way to, 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 to do this. You know, I, I'm not running a science lab here as such, so...
And then what are you going to do about this stuff? Because I'm pretty much convincing myself I've got to do something with it. Okay, let's just take a peek here. See, well, yeah, there's definitely dust on there. Let's take a look. So what I need to do is increase the magnification quite a bit on this. To, uh, let's just see if I can just focus it a little bit better. Drop the stage down a bit. Fibers on here. So yeah, I got it all over here. That's really what we want to look at. Okay, wait a second. Here. That's the stuff, all right. Yeah, I'm gonna have to increase the uh, uh, zoom. Uh, this is tricky with this particular kind of microscope here. Let's see if I can do it. stage again. Up, 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 up. I don't know if this is going to be conclusive. Let's go up, 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 more, more power. change the uh, lighting a little bit. I'm certainly not, not, you know, there's a couple fibers in there, but they look like, uh, you know, they'd be from clothing or something like that. Just change the lighting here. Maximum, maximum magnification here, which is quite high. It's about 800 on this, on this guy. That's why he's trouble to use. And of course, the uh, we, we we really don't know when we looked at those pictures uh, of uh, asbestos. We really didn't know what the magnification level was in those images. Those dead bugs. <laughs> hey, one of them just moved. Oh, what's happening there? Did I see that? Is a no. There's nothing. There's nothing touching this. So it could be everything from static charges when I swept up the dust. And there's a piece of plastic and uh, some kind of static got on there, but. I saw two things move there. You know what? Two of those things look like bugs to me. Um, I'm sorry, I can't really, I can't point to them. Maybe I can point to them. Oh, I don't think so. How can I possibly point to this? Hello, peanut. Oh, I just knocked it off. Okay. No, my pointer is bigger than the, uh, <laughs> than the view. Well, I hate to say it, but I think I see bug bodies with legs sticking out of them. Yes, Peanut. Are you here? Here you are. Hello. Well, let's see if I can go even higher magnification here. I think I must be close to the limit. Yeah, that's the limit. Well, I don't see anything here that makes me think it's asbestos. 
which is probably a dangerous thought. I mean, I, I can't be sure of anything here, really. Let's try a little different uh, lighting here. special light for this, actually. Let's use the special light. I'm only going to do this once, probably, in my life. This is it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's anything conclusive here. I want to know if those were bugs I saw. That's what I. <laughs> that's what I become interested in now. Really? I don't think there'd be bugs in this dust. It sounds ridiculous. Oh, wrong control. Here we are. don't see anything that looks like asbestos. I think what we could say safely is the bulk of this dust is not asbestos. But we really can't, like, there's a long fiber down near the bottom of the screen there. Whoops, what happened there? Down near the bottom of the screen. Kind of light it there. But that's a really long fiber. It's probably a, a hair or something. Who knows? Okay, enough of this. Enough of this, right? Is that right, Peanut? Peanut, are you getting, uh, bored with all this nonsense. Oh, here he goes. I was just going to put him on camera, but no. Okay, so the question is now, what do we do about the dust that's in here? So our options are do nothing. Just carry on. That's what I've done with every other radio. Never concerned myself with this to this degree. Number two, try to clean it out of there. How do you clean it out of there? Yeah, don't even do that. Don't. I just huffed my breath into it. And that's a mistake. Um, vacuuming is a possibility, but I think with these t small fibers and your typical run-of-the-mill vacuum, you blow the fibers out the back of the vacuum to some degree. Depends how much stuff's in the bag already. Or what kind of... Uh, if you've got one of those uh, tornado vacuums, I think small particles are going to go right through it give you a false impression you've done something good. So I think vacuuming is out, blowing it off. Could go outside and blow this, but I don't have anything to blow it with. Could go outside and on it. Uh, no, no, I'd blow it right in my face. And how, how effective would that be anyway? Is that going to get it to the point where it's significantly less a risk than it is now? It's already a low risk. I mean, I'm not going to get sick from this. Uh, Or another alternative is uh, personal protective equipment and put on things like this. I keep this stuff in my shop handy all the time. So I, so I'll use it. I keep it right here. Um, that's a possibility. Sounds like overkill to me. Uh, but that, that's a way of doing it. I wouldn't even need that big uh, gas uh, half face mask there. Just use a paper, a paper one. Uh, make it, probably most of the paper one would do is make me feel better as opposed to actually blocking any anything significant. I can also wipe up the bigger surfaces uh, that are just available here. Well, why not do that? Just what, what's easy to remove, I'll remove. I just get a moistened cloth and just go in and just kind of remove it. Then I'll leave the shop for a while uh, because there'll be particles. all overkill but uh, you know I'm going to pursue this in depth once and then from that I'm going to go on with my life and this is my one chance to pursue this in depth
I think the best thing I can do is wipe up what I can and uh, carry on if I get concerned. I do have a face mask to wear. This isn't the amount of asbestos that I should be that concerned about, I don't think. Um, the main thing is, uh, what is the main thing? Just act with knowledge. Okay, I'm going to wipe this guy up and we'll carry on. Okay, well it just suddenly dawned on me. I have asbestos that I can grab a sample of. There it is. Let's stick it on here. We can take a look at the real McCoy here and see what it looks like under the microscope as the, uh, the next step along the way in doing this. That's what it looks like. It doesn't look like that. There we are. Bit of focusing here. So this is the real McCoy now. Well, they look glassy, don't they? They don't look quite as straight as I expected. Frankly, they're longer. They're in bundles, a little bit bundled. Probably the natural state when this stuff forms is it's uh, all essentially uh, not really bundled. The whole thing is a bundle, I think. I think there's some dirt in this asbestos. Go this way. Yeah, I like, like that stuff. So that's, you know, so I did see stuff like that in the dust. Um, I hadn't changed the magnification and there were, there were fibers that long. There was a couple there, which I said I thought was maybe hair. Because they were curvy, they didn't, they weren't perfectly straight. These aren't perfectly arrow straight either. There's a little bit of a bend in them. Look at that one down at the bottom there. This, this large thing here, large. So that's got to be a bundle of fibers. And then you can see the individual very very tiny fibers this microscope set to 800 times right now i think it is uh, magnifying 800 times so those those tiny fibers gee can i get a piece of hair there i don't have a lot of hair to spare i got one yeah i got one of my hairs here and my hair is really thin i mean it's not i mean the individual hair fibers which i just i just lost my hair here <laughs> lost. Well, I've lost what's left of my hair. Okay, there. I think I'm getting it under now. No. Oh my god. Well, has it got a charge on it? What's going on? <laughs> oh, gotta get another one. Get one from the side here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no wonder I'm losing my hair. Oh my gosh, did that easy to pull hair out of my head? Okay, let's get it in there. <laughs> okay, I think we might be able to find it here. Let's see. <laughs> well, how are we going to find it on that? Um, reduce the zoom. Reduce the... even closer. That's a funny microscope. That's my hair. <laughs> Pretty sure. That's my hair. And look at how thin those fibers are in comparison. Oh my gosh, the fibers are a hundredth the width, some of those fibers. And I'm telling you, you can't see my hair. Have a look for it. Really? Have a look for it. <laughs> Where's my hair? There we go. I think that's the end of the asbestos experiments here this morning. Okay, so I, I didn't plan to uh, video this, but I'm going to talk a little bit. Since I started wiping this, I realized that, you know, there's more to the story here. While you're working on a radio like this and you're removing parts, you're getting this stuff on your fingers. 
And then uh, what are you doing with your fingers? You're going to go pick your nose or something like that. And uh, maybe whistle some cat calls. You get your fingers in your mouth. And you're transferring the fibers around, maybe without realizing it. Again, I just don't think there's enough asbestos here to be a concern. Maybe if a little child came in here, I would become more concerned. Um, first, I would wonder where the little child came from. <laughs> that would be my first concern. Um, this one's all black. Uh, I think you just don't want to be cavalier uh, with it with this stuff. I have a background in asbestos work, believe it or not. Uh, when I worked for electric utility, uh, I was dealing with big fat power cables that were all wrapped with as a, an asbestos cloth uh, called a listing. Uh, so you have a big power cable the size of your arm here in a manhole under the streets of uh, Toronto, in fact, and uh, maybe uh, 8,000 volts between the conductors inside here. And uh, when this guy blows it's a huge explosion the explosion comes out it's huge and powerful it's an electric arc through uh, ionized gas uh, under high voltage with Niagara Falls behind it so that blast can come out reach the next cable where the cables and manholes are only a few feet apart like this come up blow a hole in this cable make it fail and the next thing you know this one will, will cause another cable to fail and the whole manhole can catch fire and it happens. To stop that they wrap all the cables with asbestos cloth. They actually look a little like my arm only asbestos, white asbestos. Tape about this wide. A cable splicer with no particular protection back in the 20s or 30s or 40s. You take that wrap and just wrap it around. You have to get five or ten bundles of this stuff to wrap it around the cable. There's 15 feet of cable in a manhole, maybe 10 cables. That's a lot of asbestos. The worst sort. The worst sort. Once you have the cables wrapped in asbestos, when one does blow, it'll blow the asbestos away for sure. This is a whopper of an explosion happening in this little area here. Uh, in some cases, the short circuit current in the fault on the cable was similar to one third of the power being consumed by the city of Toronto. These are big enough explosions to heat the air up in the manhole in a fraction of a second and blow the manhole lid off straight up into the air. Seriously, people have been killed that way. There was a guy killed in Buffalo. It was a police officer, I think, driving down the road. Manhole explosion, popped the lid up, and he drove right into the lid as the lid fell. Came right through the windshield. That's a 500-pound or 400-pound chunk of cast steel hitting you. Woo! -hoo. So, so the one blows, blows a hole, the big blast comes out, but the other cables have asbestos around them, and they're protected. They're protected enough that you won't get what's called a communicated fault. That's what that's called. There you go. Consequently, there were tons and tons and tons of asbestos in the underground distribution system in all the major cities of North America and around the world. In Toronto, it's all been removed. It was a big, big process of guys wearing, you know, moon suits and the whole shot to remove it all. So I have a background with asbestos. Chances are I did get exposures uh, back then. I didn't, nobody, we, we knew asbestos was a, a little bit dangerous, but it wasn't talked about that much when I first started working. In lots of cases, I'm the one I'm, I, I used to get uh, samples of the blown piece of cable. Well, it was a lot bigger than this. You get about a meter of cable, weigh about 50 to 75 pounds. It's a solid, like a solid, full of copper in there with a big hole in it, and often the asbestos is still on it. And they bring this to my little laboratory that I had where I was working, and uh, I would dissemble it. I would take off the asbestos, and then I'd look at the cable and the fault and all that kind of stuff, and I'd take photographs and make notes, because I, I had to teach myself how to analyze a cable fault like that. Oh my god, I've talked way too much. I've talked way too much. Way too much.